Good morning. Thank you for your patience this morning. I appreciate that. I was running a little bit behind, actually trying to get everything pulled together. Nothing else. Doing God's time, I guess, but not Mike Walker's time. Love him so much. Church, I heard in the newspaper the other day, there's coming a day that actually people will look and won't understand their, won't believe their eyes, won't understand what's going on. Christians will actually be floating in the air. They will be rising. The next event will be actually the dead in Christ will rise out of their graves. It's a promise. Can't wait for that day. No, I'm not ready to die yet because I have more stuff to do. Amen? For the Lord, not for Mike Walker. Amen? But one of these days, we're going to fly away. Will you stand with me this morning and we'll open the service actually with, I'll fly away. If you feel like clapping, hands in the air, whatever you want to do, remember, you're before the Lord. Well, some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. by and by I'll fly away take it away Sharon Of praise, thank you, Lord. Well, good morning. Mickey, turn the mic on. <laughs> good morning. It's so good to be with you this morning. As we open with a word of prayer this morning, I uh, wanted to bring a couple of prayer requests to your knowledge, and then you can give me some back if you know of some that didn't make the list. Um, John Cross was involved in an ATV accident out on a hunt last week and is had some, some chest injuries, but he's good as far as no broken things as far as we know. But be praying for John. Uh, his son Charlie had a broken collarbone, had to have surgery to have it replaced or repaired. And uh, so just be praying for them as they recover. Uh, as you look around this morning, there's a lot of our family missing. We've got a lot of folk that are either traveling or have company in or having medical difficulties. Um, Mike Walker, or Watson rather, um, had to go to the emergency room uh, earlier this weekend, but they released him and sent him back home again. So he's continuing to struggle in his recovery with the various inflammations and issues that he's got. 
Any other prayer requests that you're aware of that, that aren't on the list that, that we need to bring up? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Got it. Yes, sir. Brent, don't yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Let's bow in the word of prayer. Lord, you have told us to be still. That is not what our culture tells us to do. Our culture breeds us from the time we are infants to run around like Chicken Little every time a nut hits us in the head. You remind us to be still. You remind us, Lord God, that in that stillness you will declare yourself, God. In that silence, in that quiet space, you meet us. And Lord, as we gather in this place, we do so with a stillness in our hearts. For the rest of us are chaotic and overwhelmed by the concerns of the moment. Deep, real concerns. Lord, this morning we've heard of injuries and accidents, of cancer diagnoses and diabetes racking bodies. Lord, there are so many things that hurt our hearts. Issues for salvation. Issues of leaning completely on you in the midst of situations we don't understand. <laughs> Lord, we'd be remiss if we didn't admit to you that our nation is in desperate need. And Lord God, I pray that in this stillness we might be reminded that the need that we have is for Jesus, not for a political party. Or the chaos that surrounds us is because this world no longer honors and respects you. But we do. And we come this morning to lift you up, to praise your name, to ask you to meet us in our need. That you would provide healing, stability, comfort. In those same, we would also ask for challenge and growth. For Lord, far too often, and I'll just speak for myself here, it's easy to get complacent and hard to be a follower. Lord, I ask that you would minister to each and every one of our hearts, that the songs that we sing would draw us into your presence, that the word that we open and read would draw us closer to you, that our times of communion, even if we're fighting with a silly cup to get the stuff out, but that time of communion would not be distracted. In our times of giving, even though we're no longer taking that specific time, but this act of dropping those things in the plate as we leave, may that not just be perfunctory. May it never be obligatory. But may those times be done in worship as we continue to recognize you. Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for this people. I thank you for the folks that we know and love that aren't here. And Lord, we would pray them back here. 
Lord, whatever is going on in their world, we ask that you would return them to us, that we can continue to love and support and enjoy them. Lord, as we give you this time, we recognize your presence with us, and for that we praise you, for you are an incredible God, and we love you, and we here to give you praise. Amen. Amen. Are you guys actually getting my emails that I'm sending out that has actually the church service in there? If you're not getting them, actually, please get with actually our church secretary and get an email that actually works for you. And uh, that way, if I'm sending something out like music or something different going on, actually, in the, the, the music end of the, actually the service, you guys know. Heads up. I tried actually during the, 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 the whole episode with actually the virus and everything else, when we actually were completely away from each other, I tried to keep correspondence because it was the only time that I could actually, I could communicate with you. So now we're together, I still keep sending them out so that way you kind of know what's happening. But there's a lot of people that are missing that still are there. So definitely is actually, if you know people that are out and you don't see them here because actually they're staying away because they're worried, Definitely get us their email so we can put the in the uh, church secretary's actually in her box or email box, Outlook box, so that way you can get those messages for sure. The reason I'm saying that because I sent out one this last week and I asked a question. How many Christians does it take to screw in a light bulb? How many? Zero, because God's done turned the light on, amen? And there's many scriptures in the Bible that says, let your light shine, amen? Let's sing this this morning. Let my life shine in the night time. Let it shine, shine on through. Let it shine. Sing more time. Let my life shine in the night time. Let it shine all day through. Let it shine, shine on oh Jesus. Alone in the darkness, I did not know which way to go. Then the Lord, He turned the light on, He changed my life, He saved my soul. Come on, sing another chorus. And let my life, let my life shine in the night time. Let it shine all day through. Let it shine, shine for Jesus. Let it shine, shine on you. Let my life shine in the light of time. Let it shine all day through. Let it shine, shine for Jesus. Let it shine, shine on you, rich. And now I live for just one purpose, that the Lord can shine through me, cause His love can shine on others, and let His Spirit set on free, so let my 
light, let my light shine in the night, shine in the night time, let it shine all day through, let it shine, shine for Jesus, let it shine, shine on you, one more time. So let my life, let my life shine in the night, shine in the night time. Let it shine all day through. Let it shine, shine for Jesus. Let it shine, shine on you. And I said, and let it shine, shine on you. Amen. You guys know that song? Ah, it's, it's an old song. Been around for a while, but don't play very much. Amen. Did you get the memo? Mark, did you send the memo up? Was it you that sent the memo? No, what is it? Fred, did you send the memo? No, no memo, okay? I think it's actually called, actually the memo is called like the Holy Bible. It's the memo that tells us Christians what to get ready for. Remember the meetings? When you were in actually work here in schools, whatever the meetings, you got a memo? The Bible is our memo, guys. It actually tells us to be ready, okay? Be on time. Be prepared, amen? Cause there's going to be a meeting in the air. There's going to be a, a meeting in the air, in the sweet, sweet by and by. I'm going to meet you, meet you there in that home beyond the sky. Such singing you will hear, never heard by mortal ear, and with glorious I do. Be glorious, I do declare. And God's own Son will be the leading one at the meeting in the air. Many things will be missing in that meeting. For mortars both will have no place at all. There'll be never be sermons of the sinner. A heated call. There will be no morning under loved ones. Sorry. There'll be no lonely nights of pleading prayer. All our burdens and our anguish will be lifted at the meeting in the air. There's going to be a, a meeting in the air in the sweet. By and by, I'm going. 
going to meet you, meet you there in that home beyond the sky. Such singing you will hear, never heard by mortal ear, will be glorious, I do declare. And God's own Son will be the leading one at the meeting in the air. There'll be no doubters missing altogether. All skeptics will be absent on that day. There will be no grumblers present to serve us. And the archons will be busy far away. The saints will have their seal upon their forehead. Rest in riblets, hundred ransom ones can wear. All will have a wedding garments will be present at the meeting in the air. There's going to be a, a meeting in the air at the sweet, sweet by and by. that home beyond the sky. Such singing you will hear, never heard by mortal air, will be glorious, I do declare. And God's own Son will be the leading one at the meeting in the air. One more time. There's no wind of the in the air in that sweet, sweet by and by. I'm going to meet you, meet you there in that home beyond the sky. Hallelujah! The singing you will hear, never heard by mortal ear, will be glorious, I do declare. And God's own Son will be the leading one at the meeting in the air. And God's own Son will be the leading one at the meeting in the air. Amen? Are you ready for your meeting? Take notes during the sermon because that's going to get you through the meeting. Amen. Amen. I'm satisfied with just a cottage below, a little silver and a little gold, but in that city will shine I want a gold on that silver line I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow and someday Don't 
thank me for all deserted or lonely I'm not discouraged I'm heaven bound I'm just a pilgrim in search of a city I want a mansion a harp and a crown I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow and someday yonder we will never more wander but walk on streets that they are pure as gold i got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright Amen. Are you excited? Amen. Ah, yes. I don't want a mansion. I don't want a crown. I don't want a harp. I just want to wrap my arms around my Jesus. That's why I want to go home. Not because I get a reward while I'm in heaven. This is not an investment program. It is, but it's not an investment that the things I do uh, gets me that mansion. The things I do is because I love him here on this planet. And to see him and say, welcome home, Michael, my good, faithful servant. And wrap his arms around me, physically touch me. That is my reward. Amen. Of time the day seems long.
the tempter will be banished. You'll lay your burdens down. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials seem so small. Yes, excited. You may be seated. Good morning to you all. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> oh, the music. Some things have changed uh, during this COVID-19, you know. It sure has. Our music, with just these two, it just fills, it just fills the sanctuary with beautiful song, doesn't it? Uh, with Mike on the guitar here and, and mom over here. I like to call her mom because she kind of reminds me of my mom, uh, even though I'm a lot older than her. Uh, <laughs> she, she does such a great job. And don't we miss uh, Lyman? Lyman used to be back here on the keyboard. Uh, can, can you imagine those two playing some honky tonk uh, music? It, it would go pretty good. It would be pretty good together on that. So things have changed. Uh, the communion table is set for us today. It's just in a different manner where we were not able to pass the trays uh, through, and that we that we need to uh, pick up. Um, our, our little wafer and juice out in the foyer. So if, if someone needs one of those, uh, uh, one of the guys, Bob, back there will um, will find you one. And uh, today, uh, today's a great day to be here. Uh, even though there's not so, so many here, uh, we still we still need to come into the Lord's house and honor the Lord by uh, taking communion. Uh, I was um, walking my dog, uh, well, actually my older daughter's dog yesterday, and uh, I was talking to the dog, and the dog wasn't talking back, that's okay. Uh, so I was talking to myself, <laughs> yes, and uh, was thinking about today uh, with communion here, and and uh, I have three neighbors on my block down at the end that I haven't met yet. Uh, they're brand new in the neighborhood, and I, I'm thinking, well, I should really be talking to them about uh, the Lord's house and coming. Uh, to the Lord's uh, place, and I and I I'm thinking that I, when I do talk to them, uh, I will talk about communion. To commune, you need to come to to our church out on Passion Play Road and uh, enjoy some corporate prayer, enjoy prayer individually, and commune with us. Uh, you'll meet new friends. Uh, you'll hear good music. Um, you'll hear a good message by Pastor Mark. will give a good message. And uh, to, give, to commune is very important. Uh, if I may read out of Mark, the book of Mark. Oh, 
while they were eating, Jesus took the bread and gave thanks and broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take, take this. This is my body. You could just peel back the very top back and the wafer will be there for you. Shall we pray? Dear Father, thank you so much for you. Thank you for taking our sins and going to the cross. Father, you paid the ultimate price for us, Father. You hung there on the cross, Father, and took all the sins of the world away. And these things we deeply appreciate, Father. Amen. And then he took the cup. He gave thanks and offered it to them, and they all drank from it. Then he said, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. He says, I tell you the truth, I will not drink again the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. Then they sang a hymn. It must have been a beautiful hymn, thinking of Jesus and the disciples singing uh, as they went off to uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. And you can peel back for the cup. May I pray, Father, thank you for... Thank you for everything that you did for the, on the cross for us. The shedding of your blood, Father. You paid the ultimate sacrifice for us. Father, we take this cup in remembrance of you. And that we may never forget uh, all that you uh, have done for us, Father. And we take this cup for you today, Father, in remembrance of you. Amen. Well, I wish a few more people were here today, but, you know, we're here, right? <laughs> uh, this song, many, many songs that the Lord has given me have, have just been inspired when I was reading scripture, and this is one of them. And the scripture was Isaiah 55, and it says, your ways are higher than my ways, your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. And I want to sing that song, and I want you to listen to it, and, and let it help you to praise him just to think how much higher he is than we are and how grateful we are for that praise the lord start it over. Is that okay? Okay. Jehovah, 
Now it's my turn, Grayson. And, and I've told them before, and I'll tell every parent that brings a child into this place, the day I can't out-preach a screaming brat, I need to give it up and go back to the house. So I'll tell you what, as long as we've got young people in this church, we will love them, we will take them, we will bring them in because that's how they learn they can't be here unless they're here they can't learn how to be here unless they're here and so we have to be a people who are willing to say you know what that's kind of noisy back there but that's okay because that's what it sounds like to make a joyful noise unto the Lord and I, I slipped over there during the worship service and I told them look don't you slip out you just stay right where you're at. And of course, if he gets to bellowing too much, I'm sure Grandma will slip him off into the nursery, but uh, I'm quite okay with him being here, and I'm glad you guys are here this morning. John chapter 5. John chapter 1, 
while you're turning to John chapter 5, we learned that Jesus is the divine, one with God, yet distinct in person from Father and Spirit, becoming flesh so that He might redeem us as the Lamb of God. At John chapter 2, He demonstrated His character in both judgment and mercy as He blessed one couple's wedding and then holds the religious leaders accountable in cleansing the temple. In John chapter 3, we see a conversation with a church leader that reveals the plan and purpose of God, the gospel, even before it becomes fact. In John chapter 4 and 5, we start to see the reaction to his witness, both in Samaria, in the land of the Gentiles, and these two healings that we looked at in the Jewish community last week. Because of this truth, because of his witness, he is now being persecuted and questioned, some might even say interrogated, by the religious leadership. And so as we open up to John chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 16 and pick up where we left off last week. And we're going to look at his answer because his answer is also a declaration to them and to us. Look with me, if you will, at John chapter 5 and verse 16. He begins this passage, So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jews persecuted him. Jesus said to them, My father is always at his work to this very day. And I too am working. For this reason, the Jews tried all the harder to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. And if you weren't here last Sunday or haven't had a chance to listen to last Sunday's message, you may not know that this all blew up because of a guy that he heals at the pool of Bethesda. And the guy, he tells the guy, get up and take your mat and walk. And so the guy's carrying his mat. And it's against the law to carry your mat on the Sabbath. That's considered work. And so the, the Pharisees of the time are saying, no, 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 you can't do that. Who told you to do that? And so they start hunting down Jesus. And so this answer is not in a vacuum. He was specifically being challenged with this idea of why are you doing what you're doing on the Sabbath day? Who do you think you are? And so Jesus is answering this question and he answers like father, like son. Now, this accusation of working on the Sabbath was part of the man-made laws constituting what, a, what actually counted as work. You have to remember this is after the, the Jews were taken into exile and they figured out that they got taken into exile because they weren't following the law right. So they doubled up on trying to make sure that they followed the law. And sometimes their rules and regulations went far and above God's law. If you're interested and you're taking notes, I would give you Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 14 and following. Deuteronomy chapter 5, 14 and some of the verses after that. Or Jeremiah 17 verses 19 through 27. In those passages, you see what God's law was about how these individuals were supposed to be behaving on the Sabbath. But Jesus' answer here is... God works. And now remember that the Jewish idea and our Christian idea of this Sabbath, this Sunday, this, this time off and this time of worship was because in six days God created the heavens and the earth and on the seventh day He rested. I want you to remember that it never says that He retired. It said He rested. And this is what Jesus is reminding them of. God went back to work. God is every single day sustaining, maintaining, and making the things that happen on this earth happen on this earth. God is not a clockmaker that he just wound this thing up and set it on the floor to watch it do what it's going to do. 
No, He is daily working. He is daily interacting. He is daily with us. And what Jesus' answer is, is incredibly profound. He says, I work. Yes. God works. Yes. And since I'm God's son, I work. For you in that culture to say that you were the son of God was to claim equality with God. How do you stand here violating the Sabbath? Because it's my law. I am God. Now, there are a lot who would challenge in modern theology the idea that Jesus never really claimed to be God. It was John and the other disciples that wrote it down that, that kind of explained that for us. But I will remind you that the Pharisees crucified him for calling himself the Son of God. They understood exactly what our modern readers don't necessarily, and that is when he said, I am the Son of God, he was claiming to be God. This was revolutionary. Not only is he referring to himself as God, but he's also differentiating himself from the Father. The Lord our God is one God. How can you, how, Father, Son, wait, there's only one, and Father, we covered that back in John 1. But this is a revolutionary thought, because the Pharisees and Sadducees hadn't read John 1. John hadn't wrote it yet, written it yet. This is the declaration. This is the introduction of the entirety of the world to who Jesus is. He is saying that the God that created the world created Sabbath for man to stop and to worship and to recognize that God is God and we're not. God is active and working every day. So as his son and true image walking on earth, Christ says, I will perform the works God gave me to do no matter what the day. In other Gospels, they'll record other conversations where Jesus compares um, this, this people that he's healed to, to an animal that's fallen in a ditch or, or a person that's fallen in a well. And he says, wouldn't you help that person? Well, isn't what you're doing to help that person work? So why are you kicking me in the shins when you would pull your ox out of the ditch? I've just healed a human being for crying out loud. Get your priorities straight. And so we see this conversation in the other Gospels, but there's some implications here in this opening. What he is saying is, God is among you. Mind your tone. You see, this is where he starts stepping into that Emmanuel, God with us. And we always think of that in terms of, oh, isn't that sweet? We got God right here with us. Instead of recognizing that the whole holiness of God is present in our midst and we should let our words be few. And what God, what Jesus is saying here is God is amongst you. Mind your tone. I'm not in the least bit repentant about violating the Sabbath because it's my day and I gave it to you and I am God. And this would have set them aback. It's no wonder John records that they tried all the harder to kill him. Okay, to kill an individual because he claims to be God is the right answer according to God. Unless, of course, that person actually is God. And see, this is what the Pharisees miss. Jesus is saying, okay, now check this out. Does what I am doing back up what I am saying? Look for yourselves. We're going to go on and, and, and really get into all the red meat that's in this passage. There's, there's several verses where Jesus just begins to unpack this. But I want you to understand that in the ancient Near East, if you were going to present a law, you would present the brief up front, and then you would give examples case by case, and then the condemnations or penalties would follow that. We're familiar with that. In the brief form, we call it the Ten Commandments. 
And then the rest of the Pentateuch unpacks the case-by-case -case examples of what those ten looked like when you broke them and what the punishment was if you broke them. And so Jesus is doing that right here. He's set out this brief. My father is always at work to this very day, and I too am working. And he lets that one kind of sit on him for a second before he begins to explain himself. And so for the remainder of this chapter, Jesus is going to be unpacking what he said. Friends, I want to step back from this for just a second and remind us of who we are because we often forget how we got where we are. We've had 2,000 years of Christian thought and theology. We know things about God because we grew up listening to it. But we don't recognize how revolutionary it was when it was first spoken. We've been raised in a nation that largely, until we showed up, honored God. There was an integration of Bible terms and thoughts into life. Think about how many of our national monuments have quotes to and of God on them. It's only in the modern that we try to move away from that. So we are ingrained in our thinking of talking. And Wednesday night I spoke about Christianese and how so many in our language will use Christian and biblical thoughts and don't even realize that they came out of the Bible. We forget that the Bible was handed down lovingly protected through generations, not discovered. So many people will, will say, well, that's just in the Bible and we can't trust that book. Well, what? the book wasn't written in a particular day and age. This Bible has been being written since Adam and Eve walked the earth. Since the beginnings of the beginning, this story has been handed down and protected. This is the story of God. We look to it as the only guide to faith and practice. This is how we know how to do what we do as Christians. God created the world to work a certain way. Let me give you an illustration. How many of you guys have ever driven a car? Why did Grayson raise his hand? Anyway, um, why... <laughs> Have, have you ever realized that a car is not designed to be driven backwards? A car is designed to be driven forward. It has the ability to back out when you drive it someplace you shouldn't have or into a tight place, but the reality is you're not supposed to drive a car backward. That's not the way it's designed. I'm not going to challenge you this morning to see if you can make it back to the house because most of us couldn't. The steering wheel works the wrong way when you're driving backwards, and it's uncomfortable, and I can't really trust my mirrors. And it, You see, you're going to get into an accident driving a car backwards for very long at all. Uh, and even worse, uh, you may not know the inner workings of an automatic transmission, but reverse works off of first gear. So think about what the RPM on an engine is when it shifts from first to second. About 10, 15 miles an hour, which means in reverse, about your top speed is going to be 10 to 15 miles an hour. And I know you guys, I love you, you're mine, I cherish you, you are not patient enough to drive home at 10 to 15 miles an hour. Amen. So you're going to blow your transmission out. So, and that's the reality. It's not designed to be done that way. The reality is the shape of the windshield, the, the way the mirrors are set, the seats and the seat belts and the airbags, the car is not designed to be driven backwards. It's an option because there's a purpose. There is a time and a place where you can back that car up. But if you were to do that at any other time, it would be inappropriate. The Bible might even call it sin. You see, because what sin is, is that God created the world to work in a certain way, in a certain relationship with Him. And when we get a hold of the wheel and we try to drive the thing backward, we tear stuff up. God has given us 
this idea of sin as being taking a specific act of God and using it against God's design. That's not the way God designed it. We as Christians are oftentimes accused of cherry picking. That is, like we go into the book and we add in things or strike out things that we don't like. Not true. There's a whole bunch of stuff I preach that I wish I could live a different way. If I had the opportunity to change the Bible, boy, there would be some stuff that would not be against the law. But I didn't get to write that book. God did. So the reality is, the Bible guides our thinking. The Bible is what we use for our guide to faith and practice. We don't add and rewrite the scriptures to fit our mood or our political agenda. No, the reverse is true. We've been handed this guide to creation that helps us to understand how to be in relationship with God. And it was written by God for our purpose, for our use, and for our good. So I say all that just because we need to be really paying attention to what Jesus is about to say to us. Here is the man who claims to be God standing in the midst of the religious men that should have recognized him as such, giving them the clearest declaration of his person and purpose to this point in John. So, if, if you will, let, let's continue in verse 19. Jesus gave them this answer. I tell you, the Son of Man can, or the Son can do nothing by Himself. He can only do what He sees His Father doing, because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. As we get into this answer, it's important to remember He's being challenged on these works on this Sabbath day. Well, what was that work? Can anybody remember what the work was? He healed a man. He didn't try to swap out the, the transmission on his motorcycle. He healed a man. He's being accused and berated because he brought health and healing and life into a man's life. He just had the bad misfortune of doing it on a Sunday or a Saturday in the Jewish calendar. The son can do nothing but himself, but only what he sees the father doing, because whatever the fa father does, the son also does. This is John 1.1. 1, 1. This is that declaration that John was understanding, where Jesus has just said, I and the Father are one. We are a unity. I don't do anything the Father doesn't do. But the Father and I deal with one another, and he shares with me because we are distinct in who we are. Wow! Don't miss that. Jesus right here redefines the Jewish understanding of God. It's why they'll kill him. He says, no, Father and Son work together. He doesn't even introduce the Holy Spirit yet. That would have just blown their heads. He, he's just starting with Father, Son at this point. And for the Father loves the Son. That's relationship, y'all. Father loves the Son and shows Him all that He does. Yes, and He will show Him even greater works than these so that you will be amazed. <laughs> you think what I did today was cool? Watch this. I'm just getting started. You haven't even understood the good that God would do. You want to call it work? Fine, I'm working just like my daddy. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son gives life to whom He is pleased to give it. <laughs> just as God creates, raises, gives life, so I will give life. Or if you want to call it work, or if you want to call it healing, or if you want to call it whatever you want to call it, I'm going to keep doing it because that's what I'm pleased to do. 
I'm pleased to give life and healing and strength to the broken and the downtrodden and the down and out. You see, I'm more concerned about life than I am about your rules and regulations. Because I gave you those rules and regulations so that you would honor God, and here I am as God, bringing about the very healing that this man would have prayed for, and you're kicking me in the shins because of your rules. You guys missed the point, he's saying to the Pharisees. Moreover, the Father judges no one. No! God is the judge of all humanity. We all understand that. We all know that. God does judge. There's no one else who gets to judge. God is the only judge. No, Jesus says, the Father judges no one. He has entrusted all judgment to the Son. Whoa. Here I am as a Pharisee attacking this man for doing this work and I've forgotten the fact that it's really healing and now he's claiming to be God and not only is he claiming to be God, he's claiming to have the power of creation and healing and he's also claiming to have the ability to judge. As a matter of fact, he says that God the Father has given him, which means we're all answerable to him. Wow. And, and guys, I don't want you to think this was a quiet conversation. This was not like what's going on right here. He wasn't talking and the rest of them just sitting there quietly. Have you ever been in a conversation with a Jewish individual? If you had that joy, you know that they're, uh, they're going to be talking back the whole time. This group of individuals is in charge of leading the people of Israel towards God. And he is flat busting their chops. They are arguing back. There is murmuring and there is chatter and there is all kinds of, well, can you believe what he said going on next to Jesus as this conversation is going on. This wasn't a script written by Shakespeare. This wasn't a play. This was the King of Kings and Lord of Lords declaring his right to reign among his people. Why would God do that? Why would God make you the judge? Why would uh, that all may honor the Son as they honor the Father? You see, God gave me the power to judge as Christ because that way you will honor me, unlike what you're doing currently in questioning me. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Do not miss the line, not in the sand. He's got a jackhammer to the floor of the temple. Here's the line, son. Cross it. Reject me and you reject God, for I have been sent by God. I am the Son of God. I have the right to rule. I have the right to heal. I have the right to judge. I am the I am. Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be judged but has crossed over from death to life. You're kicking me in the shins because of this life issue, and I'm telling you that if you would simply accept me, I would show you life far beyond helping a man get up off of his mat and walk. But there's a judgment there as well. And those who receive me have crossed over from a judgment to death to a judgment to life. Place your faith in me. Now he makes a comment on the reality of his day. He says, very truly I tell you, a time is coming and has now come. I'm going to stop there for a second. Can, can you see the mental image of this thing? This is a boom. You ever, you ever banged a gong? You know, the moment that thing says, ah, you go, whoa, 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 whoa. or you ever dropped a, a rock in a puddle? Bah. 
The time is coming and has now come. This is a reality. This is right now. Very truly, I tell you, the time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. He may be speaking spiritually for those who were dead in sin that will be living, or he may well be talking about Lazarus and some other things he's about to pull off in the coming days and weeks following this conversation. Y'all about to see something. You remember what he said right up above? If you thought the thing I did with getting this guy off his mat was good, hold on a second. I'm going to bring dead people back to life. That time has come right now and we're going to do this thing. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. As he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. Wow. Wow. God has given me creation and life because I am the Son of God. God has given me the ability to judge because I am the Son of Man. I have all the power of the omnipotent God because I am. And I have a full understanding of man because I am. Fully God fully man. Thus I have life. Thus I have authority. And then he begins to prophesy. Don't be amazed at this. For a time is coming. What's missing? And is now come. You see, this isn't, he's not talking about right now anymore. He's talking future. He says, I tell you, a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will raise to live. Those who have done what is evil will raise to be condemned. By myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear. And my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. I'm not going to judge you because you're attacking me. I'm going to judge you because you're attacking the Father. I'm not going to judge you by what's going on between you and I right this moment because you're clueless and I'm trying to help you along. But right now, you guys are in some jeopardy and you need to start listening. Because I am telling you that I am God, I am here with power, I am here to judge, and I'm going to be the one that decides your eternity. So you might want to rethink your attitude. Because those who do good will rise to life, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. And my judgment is the judgment that will count. But my judgment is not personal. My judgment is based on my trying to please God who sent me. You see, I'm still unified with the Father and what I see Him doing is what I'm doing. So if I pass judgment, it's because He passed judgment. And if I give grace and mercy, it's because I see Him giving grace and mercy. And I can just hear at this point some guy in the back of the room going, Prove it! I mean, this conversation that's going on in the, in the room as they're murmuring against him. Uh, Jesus, John doesn't write it down, but Jesus starts to respond differently. The, the conversation shifts at this moment. He says, if I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. <laughs> at which point, everybody in the room went, amen. Fool. You've been standing there flapping your jaw the whole time. Why should we believe you? You've been talking about yourself. How do we know what you're saying about yourself is true? How do we know that what you're sharing is, is from somebody other than you? He said, well, let's just start where we are. If I testify about myself, my testimony is not true. You're not going to believe it. It's not worthy because in a court of Jewish law, you had to have two witnesses. And I can't count as a witness for or against myself. So I got to find two other people. So we got it. My testimony is not true. There is another who testifies in my favor. And I know that his testimony about me is true. You have sent to John, <laughs> and he's right back to the guy writing this story. 
He, or John the Baptist, rather, not John the, the Gospel writer. He, he goes right back to where John starts with John the Baptist's witness. He says, you've said to John, and he's testified to the truth. Now, that I accept, hum not that I accept human testimony, but I mentioned it that you might be saved. <laughs> You're all like, okay, so, so who's your witness? Um, you already interrogated him. His name is John. It was down there on the river. Y'all remember? And what did he say about me? Behold the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. <sighs> what did he say about me? That I was the one sent by God. <sighs> Well, wait a minute, maybe my testimony's got some backup. If this guy down on the river told you that long before you started kicking me in the shins. John was a lamp that burned and gave light. And you choose for a time to enjoy his light. <laughs> you guys like John. John was telling you all kinds of stuff, and you were like, yes, that's really good. I like that. Man, we got to figure out how this thing works. Yeah, and so you enjoyed his light. <laughs> guys, I have a testimony weightier than that of John. What I have to tell you makes what John say sound silly. I've got the profundity of God. I, I want to share with you all kinds of things. For the works that the Father has given me to finish, the very works that I am doing, insert, the very works that you are questioning, testify that the Father has sent me. Whoa, 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 whoa what? <laughs> Can you heal a guy? Can you look over and with a spoken word bring healing? No laying on of hands, no magic chant, no magic potions, no shaking some bag of crystals. Can you demonstrate what God did in the beginning and speak life? Because that's what I did to that guy. If that's not from God, where is it from? You see, the very things that I am doing demonstrate and testify that what I am doing is the work that God gave me to do for only God could do these things. And the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You want two witnesses? How about John the Baptist and God? You see, he himself testified concerning me. Now, you've never heard his voice or seen his form. This is where he really gets them. Nor does his word dwell in you. For you do not believe the one he sent. Wow. Again, Jesus is making this declaration of, look, I am from God, and the reason that you're not recognizing that I'm from God is because you're disconnected from God. Here you are, the leaders that are supposed to be bringing people closer to God, and you're not. You're lost and confused. It's no wonder the people around you are. You don't have the Word of God in you. And that's demonstrated because you don't believe in me. Oh, okay, so, so why would you believe in me? I, I, let, let, let's, let's turn the corner again here. You study the scriptures. Witness number three. John the Baptist, God, and now we're going to go to the scriptures. And you study the scriptures diligently because you think in them you have eternal life. Guys, this is not a self-help book. This is the truth. This is not a talisman. You can't just carry this Bible everywhere you want to go and live the way you want to go because you think God's going to like you because you've got a Bible under your arm or a fish on your keychain or a Jesus bumper sticker on your car. It has to be a part of who you are. Jesus is saying, you've studied this scripture because you think you have it because of some head knowledge, but you're missing it. Because these are the very scriptures that testify about me. If you knew the scripture, you would see that what I am doing is fulfilling the scripture and you would recognize who I am. Yet you refuse Oh, not only do you not see it, you're rejecting it. You refuse to come to me to have life. What he's saying to him is, go back to your scriptures, gentlemen. Look for the truth. Don't look for your self-help. Don't look for your legalism. Look for the truth. Now, I'm not going to take glory from human beings, but I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. Wow. 
I know I keep saying wow, but I, you, you, as you study through this and you understand what Jesus is saying to them and to us, the judgment against these individuals was they did not have the love of God in their hearts. What they had was legalism and law and judgmentalism and separation and you're not good enough. May we never be that church. May we never discredit the love of Jesus Christ by telling somebody else that they can't get saved. Now, I also want you to notice that even though he says, I know you and that you don't have the love of God in your hearts, this is not a final condemnation. It is a current observation of fact so that they might repent. Jesus isn't bashing them and saying, well, you're just going to hell. This is not Jesus on his throne making final judgment. This is Jesus standing in the midst of the religious leaders saying, will you guys please figure this out so that you can lead the people you're supposed to lead properly because I will judge you for misleading them if you don't get yourself fixed. I've come in my Father's name. He's already claimed to be God. He's saying, I have come as God working for God as God's ambassador and you don't accept me. If someone comes to you in his own name, you accept him. How can you believe since you accept glory from one another but don't seek the glory that comes only from God. This is just a pure logical presentation Jesus is giving. He's saying, my judgment is just because I'm from the Father and I'm looking around and seeing truth. You guys don't believe truth. You pat each other on the back for your education, but you've never known who I am. Uh, wait, I've been talking this whole time about judging you. Wait, let me back up from that. Let me back up. Don't think that I'm going to judge you. Wait a minute, you said that all judgment was given to you by the Father and now you're not judge. Wait, wait, what do you mean? See, I'm not here to accuse you. I, I, I'm not the accuser, I'm the judge. You see, see don't, don't, don't misunderstand, friends. I'm not here as the prosecuting attorney. I'm here as the judge. The prosecuting attorney in your case, Pharisees, Sadducees, and leaders of Israel, will be Moses. Your accuser is Moses who, on whom your hopes are set. Because if you'd have believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote about me. He just told the most educated men in Israel that they didn't know their scriptures. And that if they had known their scriptures, here, guys, are, are you keeping count here? We've already had the testimony of John and the testimony of the Father and the testimony of the scriptures. And now Moses is being added to this idea of scriptures. Uh, so the reality is you need to be careful. You need to recognize that by the standard you are judging, you're going to be judged. And the reality is, you don't believe what Moses wrote, so how in the world are you going to believe what I have to say? It's an interesting ending. It's an interesting stop point. He says, look, you can disregard my word as Christ, but okay, we'll let you go away with that. And you can disregard John, but ignore the Father and Moses, that is the Scriptures, at your own peril. If you guys are going to claim to be followers of God, then you better follow his book. And his book and the word of God and the presentation of God is what gives us a knowledge of God so that we can figure out how in the world do we pursue God. You see, the religious leadership had questioned his actions. Why are you working on the Sabbath? And why are you telling this guy to work on the Sabbath? You're violating the law. There's this unspoken challenge of who do you think you are? What gives you the right? Jesus' answer gives an answer both to the spoken and the unspoken questions. 
He gives a clear and unmistakable declaration of his person and his purpose. It is this that causes the Jews to hate him and his disciples to follow him. You see, we have this declaration before us. I believe that more than any other, this passage in John chapter 5 is the defining moment in human history. When Jesus Christ declared who he is and says, accept me or reject me and live with the consequences. Because you will live. You will be raised to a life of life or you will be raised to a life of condemnation. I am the judge and I judge justly because the Father and I work in tandem. This is the defining moment in human history. His actions testified to his words. And so I entitled this morning's message, The Answer. Not because Jesus gives an answer here, but because he demonstrates that he is the answer. He demonstrates that he is all that the Bible said he would be. He presents himself as God in love who saves. He has come for that purpose to do what the Father asked Him to do. Do not think that God the Father and God the Son were on different sheets of music. Paul will pick up on this in his epistle when he says that for His pleasure, God the Father sent Jesus to the cross. Jesus prayed that it would not be so, but he honored what the Father had asked him to do. Why? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only Son. And Jesus, demonstrating for us, prays, not my will, but thine. And steps in faith to do what the Father had asked him to do. I think the challenge is clear before us, friends. This isn't necessarily a question of salvation, those for, though for some of us it may be. If you have never accepted Jesus Christ, if you have rejected Jesus Christ, reach down and put your fingers on your pulse really quick. If you still have one, you still have a choice. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done. It doesn't matter what you've experienced or the things that you've accomplished or not. If you have rejected Jesus Christ, seek the Lord while He may be found. Turn around right now and repent and find salvation in Him. For He is not wanting to judge you for eternity in this moment any more than He did those Pharisees He faced 2,000 years ago. Get yourself straight with me so that you don't have to face the judgment of death. But I also think there's a message in here for those of us who follow Him into how deeply do we follow Him? How deeply do we trust Him? He is God and there is no other. He is life and there is no other. He is joy. He is strength. He is that Holy Spirit that comes within us and fires us up to do the things that He's called us to do. Are we willing to walk where Jesus walked? Are we willing to pick up that cross and follow Him? Are we willing to say, I believe that He is the Son of God and my personal Savior? Because if that is a truth, if that is a reality in your world, then there is nothing to hold you back from doing the very thing the Father has asked you to do. And I can't stand here this morning and tell you that I know what God's doing in your life because I don't. But you do. You know where He's called you. You know where He's passioned you. You know the things that He gets you excited about. You know those things that you look around and go, Oh, if I only had the chance, would I love to? Jesus is declaring this morning, You have the chance. 
I gave it to you. I am God. Follow me. Would you bow your heads with me? Heavenly Father, I praise you for the word of your declaration. Lord, we sometimes get so confused and we lose vision of your majesty and your greatness and your grace. Lord, help us to claim to the reality of who you are, to not accept the watered-down version that the world would hand us, but to see you as he who created the world. And if that is true, then there truly is nothing impossible through Jesus Christ. You are God. I pray, Lord, this morning for those who may not know you, for those who may be under the sound of my voice that have never repented, have never given their lives to you, and have messed things up. Lord, we all have. We've all been there. Lord, thank you for the opportunity that you give for that person this day, in this moment, to say, Father, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Draw me to you. For those of us, Lord, who follow you for a day or for a lifetime, may we again be encouraged in the truth of your word, the strength of your promise, the hope of your salvation. And we give you the glory and the praise and the adoration for all of these things through Christ our Lord. Amen. If you would stand with me this morning, please. Jesus, Jesus, there's just something about that name, Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance Jesus, Jesus, let all heaven and earth proclaim. Kings and kingdoms will all pass away, but there's something about that That again, please. Jesus, 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 there's just something about that day. Master, Savior, Jesus, like the Jesus, let all heaven and the Mick, will you please turn on Beth's mic again? Beth, you had an announcement that you wanted to make this morning. Want to take this? <laughs> Permission. I love you fellows and gals so much. I really do. I love you. 
And I've decided to do something because I prayed about it a lot and it's God's will. He is moving me to another church just because they need me. Uh, it's a church I was in before and the pastors come back and uh, he asked me if I would be the worship leader and sing the specials and all. And so I prayed a lot about it and uh, asked my husband to pray about it and he definitely wants to go back there. So that's where we're going. Now it may just be temporary. I don't know how the church is going to go and, and I asked them to seek another leader, you know, music leader. So anyway, I just wanted y'all to know that I've just been blessed to be here and to get to know you and I'll keep you in my thoughts and hopefully you'll ask me to come back again and sing, okay? <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, no, well, I'll miss you too. God bless you. Would you reach out your hands with me and play? Heavenly Father, we commission Beth to the work that you have called her to. Lord, I pray that you would minister through her to the church that she goes to save, that she goes to help, that she goes to work in. Lord, they have a need, and she has the skills and abilities that you have given her. Let her use those skills to your glory. Lord, for whatever season you have in mind, we thank you and rejoice with her for this opportunity. And we help, uh, would ask you to help her to know the love that we have for her and her place with us, that she is always welcome to return. And Lord, I pray that you would send her out in joy, in peace, and in absolute strength to do what you've asked her to do. In Christ's name, amen. Okay, so when, or tomorrow, 4.30, Ladies Bible Study starts back up. So you ladies that want to involve yourself in the Bible study, 4.30 tomorrow. In here. In here, okay. And then last weekend after service, we swapped the library and the prayer room downstairs. If you haven't seen the work that we did, I'd invite you to stick your head in the two rooms and see what the new digs look like. And since you have to go downstairs anyway to look at the, pr or the, the new library, why don't you spend some time shopping? There's a whole bunch of material down there that's for sale, that's decorations for home or work or wherever you can use them. And so I'd encourage you to go down there and take a look at that. It's exceptionally successful sale this past weekend down there and we'd just like to finish that up. One last piece before I go. I want to promote Wednesday night. I want to promote to you, if you're not here on Wednesdays, or if you can't be here on a Sunday, we record CDs and DVDs. We record both audio and visual, so that there's no excuse for you not to keep up on what's going on in the church. Guys, my job is to present you before Christ doing all the things I can to strengthen and empower you. And if you're only engaging with us on Sunday morning, you're missing half the battle. Because what I do on Sunday feeds what I do on Wednesday, feeds what I do on Sunday, feeds what I do on Wednesday. There is a consistent thought that runs through that. So if you're not catching the Wednesdays, you're missing half the message. And so I just encourage you, either by CD or DVD, go online, or even better, if you can be here, be here. We'd love to have you engage in that so that you can better understand God's call upon you, His strengthening for you, His healing for you. Some of you have said, to you, you know, I, I'm not real crazy about the way you preach through the books on Sunday. I wish you'd talk about specific topics now and then. That's what I do every Wednesday is we deal with specific topics. And so I just encourage you guys to engage with what's going on here at the church so that you might be fully prepared to give an answer to the world around you for the hope that you have in Christ Jesus. Now may God give you His strength, His power, His majesty, His authority, that you might recognize that you are blood-bought children of the Most High God, called to reach into this world as His representatives and ambassadors, so that all men might be drawn to Christ, that He might be lifted up, that He might be acknowledged, so that we would recognize it's not about us, it's all about Him, and that we would give ourselves in that service to our God and our King. Amen.